Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Great to see so many folks filing in. We'll give everybody a few minutes to come on board for our first Healthcare Facility Symposium webinar of 2022. Great to just see those numbers going up. Seeing everybody come in the room. All right. Welcome. As I said, it's great to see everyone or have everyone join us this afternoon for the first Healthcare Facility Symposium webinar of 2022. We're thrilled to have you. Um, we're pl very pleased to have Sinlon as our sponsor and content provider for today's webinar. Um, we appreciate their support and glad to continue doing these um, webinars to offer education throughout the year to our community. Um, today's webinar is an AIA accredited. It's also HSW. Um, it looks like there was not a spot in registration to provide your AIA number. So I'm gonna put something in the chat and I'll also do a follow-up email. And if you just send your AIA number to me, um, by this Friday, and I realized that I actually didn't introduce myself. For those of you who don't know, I'm Jenna Beth Ferguson with the Healthcare Facilities Symposium. Um, and I will put that in the chat and give you my email address and you can send your AIA number to me by this Friday and we will submit um, next week for attendance. In addition, we will do Q&A as part of um, today's webinar. We'll do it at the end. So you can either send them in the chat throughout or you can just save them till the end. So without further ado, we'll get things started and I'm gonna turn things over to Rob Dent with Sinlon and he will get us started. Thank you, Genevieve. I appreciate that. Um, can everybody hear me all right? I'm assuming so. All righty. Um, so my name is Rob Dant. Uh, I'm the sales director for Sinlon. Uh, Sinlon is part of a broader organization called the Sport Group, uh, which is uh, located in Europe. Uh, so we actually have three facilities uh, that manufacture. Uh, North America um, is the largest one and where I live in North Georgia, we're also known as carpet capital of the world. So this is where uh, the majority of the textiles are made, carpeting textiles. And because synthetic turf is made in a very similar way um, and, and uses some similar backings, uh, colorists and things of that nature, um, it makes sense that it's that it's here. So um, I like to start out these presentations and just let people know uh, that I'm a normal guy. Uh, I live in a home, not a trailer. I don't live under a bridge or anything. Uh, I've got, uh, you know, three kids, five dogs, a wife, uh, and so I'm just kind of a normal guy, and, and I don't necessarily believe that the entire world has to be covered with synthetic surfaces, uh, with synthetic turf. Uh, that said, it is a very exciting uh, landscape material. I do have a landscape and design background, um, and, um, and so I, I think that there's uh, applications or places where synthetic turf makes a lot of sense. Uh, Sinlon is um, the largest global uh, network of installers, and um, in one of the segments that we're uh, that we find ourselves in, we're about nine different commercial uh, segments, um, and so one of those segments is healthcare. And as you guys know, uh, healthcare can be uh, very broad; it in, in, uh, encompasses a lot of different uh, thoughts and ideas behind it. Um, and so, as we found ourselves in this. Um, category of business, I wanted to make sure that we could uh, we could share some of the things that, that we've learned and discovered. So um, I do like to share this, uh, this photo at the beginning of a lot of my presentations that shows just kind of how far uh, synthetic turf has, has come. Uh, this is a multifamily uh, project. So it's a rooftop project. Um, it's, it's really exciting for this community in Indianapolis. Uh, downtown Indianapolis, um, and I just want to draw your attention to that gold building there where they do a really cool uh, community event, which is, you know, fire off a bunch of uh, fireworks. Uh, so it's cool if you're in the community. It's not so cool if you're a piece of plastic, right? So typically we would think that that plastic would melt. Um, so Sinlon being in the, being in the business as, as long as we have, uh, we've devised some different ways to ensure that, <laughs> that projects like this don't melt, uh, whether it's from embers from uh, fireworks or uh, to the left of the image here, 
of this screen is a, uh, is a bank of buildings where you would have reflective light. And so uh, this is just a great example of a practical application, a rooftop application, and um, the advancements in synthetic turf are such that uh, you can do really cool creative, um, you know, creative things like this. So, um, so in terms of healthcare and synthetic surfacing, um, Sinlon is a commercially focused uh, manufacturer. Uh, we're found in a broad range of healthcare projects, which, as I said a moment ago, we'll be sharing with you. Um, we are a very design-centric organization, so we're not a commodity-based organization. We're not trying to be the cheapest one. Uh, we're not trying to put, you know, turf in every single yard. Of course, we would we would take that business, um, but our goal is really to find uh, projects and products that make sense um, in the communities and. Um, and commercial uh, entities that we live and work in, right? Um, we like to balance sustainability with longevity, safety, and innovation. And of course, these are very key. So again, you'll see that these are principles that we base our work on um, and are not, uh, not always kind of uh, cohesive with commoditization, right? So you'll see that we're not trying to be the lowest cost provider um, or just do cheap stuff. We're, we're really trying to find ways uh, that make a difference. And in design related fields and in particularly healthcare, uh, this becomes very important. Um, and it can show up in simple things such as the antimicrobials and anti static components that we put in our, our synthetic turf. Um, we are the largest um, uh, network of synthetic turf uh, distributors. So we have over 120 offices. Uh, we're a global organization. And what this means for a lot of um, commercial projects is that wherever you're located, whether it's Maine or Miami or Boise, Idaho uh, or San Diego, uh, you're able to, uh, to have a consistent product line. You're able to have a consistent uh, construction. And those are very important. Um, also, uh, the fact that we're a US-based manufacturer means that uh, we can take our master batch, which is kind of the basic recipe of what we do, um, and we can create differentiated uh, products that enhance your success. So again, uh, antimicrobials, anti-static, uh, antifungals, and algicides that we put into our turf products, uh, these become very important as you're trying to advance what we do. Um, we, uh, we liken a lot of our industry to the vehicles. Um, you know, a number of years ago when I was growing up, uh, air conditioning, seat belts, uh, automatic brakes, things like that. They were, that was all new stuff, right? Um, so without further ado, uh, let's get into this. So some of you may already be familiar with synthetic turf. Uh, you might see it in very simple solutions like this where it's a deep shade uh, kind of a community. Um, or you may be familiar with projects like this where they're very complex. You've got multiple levels and tiers. You've got uh, synthetic turf walkways. Uh, you've got restaurant areas, uh, putting greens, and, and things of that nature. So, uh, so turf is really advanced to become uh, something quite complex. And again, it depends on the, uh, the community or the business segments that you're, that you're in. So I want to express what we're going to be covering today. Um, synthetic surfacing options and anatomy. So I want to kind of explain what turf is, how it's created, um, some of the different materials that you'll see. So we'll cover uh, pour in place projects. We'll also talk about artificial living wall or sometimes known as green wall. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about construction and what that looks like from, from our perspective. We'll talk a little bit about sustainability and how that ties into uh, to healthcare. It does in some places and it doesn't as much in others. We'll talk a little bit about construction, including safety and compliance, where to find documentation, where to specify things of that nature. And then uh, the part that, that I thoroughly enjoyed as, as I was putting this together is just some of the healthcare trends. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, um, you know, we're in a lot of fields. This is one of the most uh, unique. Uh, you have some of the soft uh, concepts, if you will, on the one side. Uh, so, so words like social justice, uh, safety, um, uh, wellness, uh, you know, those aren't things that necessarily we're, we're as familiar with as an installer, uh, but they certainly are within the healthcare community, right? Um, medical dogs and, and things of like of that nature, animal assisted therapies, um, that, that all means something in healthcare. Um, in terms of application, uh, it's also very broad. You can go anywhere from rooftops to parks to dog parks, right? Um, and they're all, and, and I'm 
kind of tie that in and, and uh, help you guys understand how that how that ties into healthcare. Um, so the trends are very interesting to me, and I feel um, a deep responsibility to be able to share. Um, as director of sales for our group, I, uh, I'm very privileged to have, like I said, 120 distributors that are all engaged in these different projects. And so I get to see some really cool stuff um, and just be able to tie it, uh, tie it all together. All right, so the basics of turf. Um, you, uh, if, if you think about a, uh, a sewing machine, you've got your, your thread basically, and that's what you see here. Uh, plastic yarns, if you look closely, you'll see that there's a few different shades of green. This particular example uh, shows some tan fibers in there. Uh, depending on what part of the country you are, you may see that as natural. You may see that as weird. I'm not sure. Uh, we do have 38 different SKUs that we use. Uh, they can be varying shades of green. They can also include uh, 14 colors. Uh, seven of them are chromatic and seven of them are more neutral hues. Um, that we use for prefabricated uh, products and uh, projects, and you'll see some of that represented here as well. So these larger fibers are called the face fibers, and then the, uh, the smaller fibers that you see below, the little curly ones, um, are called thatch fibers, and we'll explain what those are, for, uh, what those are used for in a few moments. Uh, synthetic turf uh, does have a backing. It actually uses two different backings. Uh, this provides dimensional stability, and then we use soy-based coatings uh, to enhance it. So we've been doing this since 2008. It is part of our sustainability, uh, sustainable leadership uh, that we've been exhibiting um, and continue to drive forward on. So you'll, you'll see that some of our turf uses sugar cane, um, obviously the soy here, um, and we even have USDA systems uh, as well. All of our turf does have holes in it. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but synthetic turf will drain typically faster than uh, native soils. Now, if you take this turf and you glue it to a chunk of concrete, it's going to drain just as well as that concrete is. Uh, so we uh, tend to be very focused as an organization on that drainage bed and what that foundation looks like. We call that base work. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in just a few moments. You'll see here I have a number of different fiber types. So if you look on the far right hand side, those tend to be uh, some basic uh, older fiber types. And if you imagine like a, a sheet, uh, the second one in like a, a sheet or a, just a, a simple rectilinear form there, that can kind of crimp or bend over and it can also reflect. So if you think about turf, uh, maybe that your, uh, that your grandmother has, let's say, or your great grandmother on the back of the porch, uh, and, it, and it's really shiny. Uh, this is one of the reasons for it. So on the landscape side of the business, we started bending and shaping and forming it in different ways uh, to give you spine, uh, which allows you uh, the, the turf to spring back a little bit quicker and add strengths in different ways and uh, refract light in different ways as well. Um, and again, we'll, we'll discuss this a little bit more. Um, but, you know, I, I had mentioned that I've got a wife and dogs, kids, the whole nine yards on the landscape side of the business. And it's different uh, on the athletic side, on the landscape side of the business, business, we just have to make sure that we create and put down products that don't make us look weird. Right. Don't make the wife or the kids look weird uh, that the dogs can pee on and not chew up. And so we've got some very basic requirements that are different than on the athletic side of the business. So if you think about uh, a football game. Uh, maybe the Georgia, you know, Alabama game, uh, go dogs and all. Um, but if you think of those kinds of games, you'll see that it has a little bit more sheen. You'll see that they use black um, infill. And those are for some uh, different safety requirements. So on the landscape side, we do things a little bit differently. Um, in the healthcare business, we've seen a lot of green walls or artificial living wall uh, material. Um, so uh, we do this for uh, vertical enhancements. Um, they tend to go on a commercial grade wireframe. They're about 32 inches by 32 inches. Uh, they're offset by about an inch, so you have proper airflow. Um, the varieties of plant material are crafted uh, from real plants and then just assembled in real creative ways. So you can get a real nice soft look and they are UV and fire rated. And these are very important uh, features to have specifically in commercial settings. And again, we'll, um, we'll show some more examples of this. Uh, port in place. Uh, so these are um, maybe some of the rubber playgrounds that you're familiar with. And again, these do pop up in the healthcare fields, uh, specifically when children are involved. Uh, you'll see that you've got a lot of uh, a lot of hues that can be used. And you'll see that in this particular picture, 
uh, which is in the Dakotas, that you're able to meld or, or put together uh, in terms of design, both synthetic turf and poured in place rubber. So you kind of get the, uh, the best of both worlds. Um, so these, these options that I provided you here, um, I do understand that they're synthetic. Again, we're not saying that we cover the entire world uh, with them. Um, but they certainly do have their place. And if you think about uh, your kids or your grandkids or certain uh, communities that you're in, or maybe heavily shaded areas or rooftops, um, you know, a lot of times it's, it's these solutions that are going to be able to survive or work um, or work for extended periods. And so that becomes very important when you're talking about commercial projects as well. So um, again, we're a modern manufacturer. We enhance value by integrating aesthetics, stewardship, craftsmanship and performance. And these four legs are very important. So we're not just focused on creating plastic grass. We understand how that's got to look. Uh, we understand the importance of um, bio-based preference. Uh, we understand that uh, soy-based products uh, contribute um, uh, a lot uh, to sustainability, sustainable um, you know, ecology, uh, things of that nature. Craftsmanship is highly important to us. So again, we're not just selling this to a bunch of guys out of a truck. Um, we go through a lot of effort to ensure that uh, the seam work is impeccable, uh, that you're shaping uh, around stone, that you're going over uh, rooftops correctly, that you can create mounds in a real creative and interesting way uh, that, that's going to give you the, uh, the lifetime warranties that we, that we put out there. And then finally, performance. Uh, this is also very important to us. Again, I started out talking about the commercial side of the business, um, and this is very important because you know, it's not just patting us on the on the back, patting ourselves on the back, rather. Um, the commercial projects really push us to excel and to do better and to plow new ground um, in terms of our brand and what we do. You may be familiar with uh, seeing our products at Top Golf. You may have seen them at NASA. You may see them on military installations. And all of these things really drive that performance. So, you know, whether you're talking... Um, you know, about uh, dimensional stability, so it doesn't wrinkle up on you, or that it just looks good and doesn't fade. These are, these are qualities that we, uh, that we live and breathe every single day. So a basic installation of uh, synthetic turf, and I'll just kind of start out this way. Um, you know, again, if you think about a 15 foot uh, wide sewing machine and a bunch of uh, yarn going through there, uh, you know, we, we punch that into the backing, that whole roll, a hundred foot roll typically uh, is taken off the machine. Um, it runs, uh, it's then unwound, uh, run through six different curing ovens uh, after it receives the green coated uh, backing. Uh, we do put our name on the back. We put a directional arrow. We have put a certification number and also made in the USA. And you're probably thinking, well, Rob, that sounds pretty darn silly because you're not gonna see the back, right? Um, and that is true, but it's also an indicator of how strongly we believe in the brand and standing behind what we do. If there's ever a reason where you're pulling up the turf, maybe 15, 20 years from now, we want everybody to understand this is our brand, we stand behind it, um, and they'll be able to match up dye lots and things of that nature. So a typical project, you have, again, your 15 foot roll. Um, after putting down a, um, about a four, uh, four to six inch base, depending on where you are in the United, Stone, uh, United States, we would use uh, like a lime rock or um, you know, a, a 57 stone that gets compacted to about 90% or 95 proctor. Um, and then we top dress with, again, an inch or two of quarter minus. And again, this is just kind of a typical basic uh, construction just for illustration purposes today. Uh, the turf gets rolled out. Uh, we would typically orient those fibers uh, towards the primary viewpoint. So if you think about coming out of your back porch with a cup of coffee, we would um, orient those fibers so they face you. Uh, we would lock down the perimeter uh, with nails uh, or uh, nails or staples or um, into our perimeter board. Again, it depends on the application a little bit. Uh, seam work, as you'll see here in the middle uh, photo to the right, uh, is very complex. We actually... Um, do a lot of installation trainings uh, for that. And we have an annual conference in just a couple of weeks here where we're bringing in about a hundred guys uh, just to kind of uh, sharpen those skills. But that, that seam work is very, very important to us. Um, so that's kind of a basic installation. Uh, once the turf is laid down, we do go over it with an infill. An infill 
um, is uh, basically a, a rounded washed silica. Um, it acts as a ballast. It regulates water, so you don't want you don't want water going through too fast, nor do you want it going through too too slow. And um, it also helps the turf fiber stand up. And then finally, um, we have specialty infills, uh, you know, green infills that have antimicrobial uh, that helps with dog parks. We have um, uh, infills that. Uh, like safe shell, they're made out of walnut and go towards uh, part of our uh, USDA certified systems. Um, and then some that, uh, that cool down turf and, and are also antimicrobial as well. So I'd mentioned that we are a US based manufacturer. Um, one of our uh, probably the strongest uh, claim to fame is the fact that as a manufacturer, we control the master batch. And this is like the, the, uh, the basic uh, cake recipe or, or the brownie recipe that I learned to make when I was a kid. Um, you know, it's not just the thing out of the box, but it's putting the raw materials together. So uh, during the pandemic, when everybody's scrambling for materials and at the same time as uh, production rates are uh, skyrocketing, um, you know, it, it makes for a real interesting combination, right? And this is where US-based manufacturers like ourselves really thrive because we're able to kind of marry those two um, uh, seemingly conflicting uh, concepts together. So we're able to make sure that we have the right resins and polyurethanes and things of that nature um, and get first dibs on those. And at the same time, you know, we're scaling up and using more than, than ever before. So, um, so controlling that master batch is very important. It also allows us uh, key additives such as the algicides, um, uh, antimicrobials and antistatics that set us apart from just commodity uh, lines of projects, uh, products rather. Um, so I'm not going to read off uh, uh, the entire slide here. I figured we've all passed uh, third grade, so we can do some of that ourselves. Uh, so I just kind of skip around and hit some of the highlights here. Um, you'll see the photo in the upper left hand side. Uh, those are actually strands of colorant being made. They get chopped up into little tiny pellets and then added into a larger batch of resin. Uh, the image on the lower side, you'll see a bunch of those spools. Uh, those are the, uh, the spools of yarn, essentially, that I had mentioned before. Uh, those can easily take uh, half a day to a full day uh, just to, uh, to load up into this giant contraption called a creel that allows you to produce a single run of synthetic turf. So there's quite a bit uh, of science and labor that goes behind this. Um, we talked about the different commercial fields that we're in. Uh, examples of this are military, hospitality. Of course, we do residential work, uh, professional golf work as well, uh, senior living, healthcare, um, automotive even, believe it or not. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty exciting time to be a synthetic turf manufacturer. Uh, we also have the strongest documentation in the market. So again, we understand that uh, for commercial applications, particularly, this is very important. So if you're looking for CSIs, if you're looking for uh, specifications on master spec or BSD, plat, uh, BSD spec link platforms were found there. Uh, we have over 200 CAD drawings uh, that are extensively uh, monitored and uh, refined um, you know, directly on our website. So they're really super easy to find. Um, and again, we're always pushing the boundaries of product and application. So we've been doing this since 1965. You may be familiar with our uh, sister company, AstroTurf. Uh, so that's also located in uh, North Georgia. Um, we differ from the athletic turf in a few key ways. First of all, our fibers tend to be a little shorter. They don't need to be quite as long. Um, you'll, you'll see that they tend to be a little bit shinier. Um, we tend to have more hues on our side, more color, and then also the infills that we use. Um, you don't typically see the, the black crumb rubber uh, fly out. So we, we just, uh, we're in a different kind of a space with different sorts of uh, requirements. So for us, sheen, texture, color, things of that nature are very important. Um, as as the, uh, the original turf company, um, again, it's very important that we protect our credibility and our name. Uh, we work with a three-part certification system. So who we bring on board and into the synthetic uh, turf fold, as it will with our, uh, as you will with our family, uh, is very important to us. Um, we also go through a golf certification uh, system 
Um, and without belaboring this too much, you know, creating those performance-based systems are, are absolutely important uh, to golfers. So, so that kind of ups the game, if you will. And then finally, uh, the synthetic turf council, because yeah, there's a council for everything. Uh, that also is kind of a national body uh, that that serves to uh, provide oversight uh, for our industry. So um, again, those are just some of the things that, that we lean on are very important to us as an organization. So, so one of the first things that installers look at uh, when we're talking about a synthetic turf uh, project is water. OK, so uh, you'll see here in this particular image, this is a hotel down in Miami. Um, you know, we, we waste a lot of water. We spend a lot of time uh, watering a particular uh, piece of ground. Uh, so in the one sense, it's really nice and easy to say, OK, well, let's put in synthetic turf. And while that's true, we've got to take a real strong look at where all that water is going. OK, so once we've removed uh, sprinkler systems, in this case, we want to ask ourselves, what is that going to look like and how do we interact with, with that water? So a naturalized uh, setting like this is Crystal Lagoon in, uh, down in Texas. Um, they have a very extensive uh, filtration system. It was very important that they did not get debris into the water. Uh, equally important for developments like this is ensuring that you have a lot of customers, a lot of people. And so synthetic turf was just kind of a natural choice uh, because you weren't going to get that debris. You're going to be able to have more people um, on this, uh, uh, you know, physically on site uh, than you would if you had natural grass where you're having to resaw to irrigate chemicals, so on and so forth. We also address water in this kind of a fashion. This is a project in Philadelphia, uh, you know, where you've got uh, lay limits and you can only, you know, dig in certain areas. And now all of a sudden you've got water kind of backing up into the site that you're going to uh, put into. And so this is kind of a, um, you know, a great example of the kind of stuff that we, that we roll up onto and have to address. So in this particular uh, situation, they put in flat drains. Um, it was just a, a real cool playground project uh, for kids there in in Philadelphia. We do take a systems-based approach when we put these projects in. So you'll see the very bottom uh, image is kind of that, that basic landscape turf construction that I mentioned. Um, as you move around on the page here on the, uh, you know, you kind of finish up on the right-hand side and you'll see uh, complex roof systems that use uh, adjustable pedestal systems, ultra base uh, underlayments underneath the turf. Uh, they may use Z-clips here to connect up to a paver system or porcelain tile. Um, and that and that bison uh, pedestal system is literally just filling a void. Um, depends on where you are in the country. If you're up in New York, you can be filling up a 18 inch void and they can be very complex. Um, if you're down south here in Georgia, where I live in Los Angeles, it may be a little bit different. In fact, they may even use stone um, on top of the roof. So um, so we understand that there's a lot of difference uh, throughout the United States and, and how that application looks. So we try to make it as easy as possible uh, for you. So uh, this slide here is a duplication of one of the other ones. So uh, thank you for that. Um, sustainable systems. So if you think about uh, the options that you have. Uh, the, the, the top playground, uh, playground image right there is one that uh, my wife and I, you know, walk the dogs nearby and everything. And that's about as natural as it gets. So that uh, EWF or engineered wood fiber uh, does what it does, right? It deteriorates, it washes out. Um, underneath the slides, uh, it's just dug out. And so it's not in compliance. Uh, with some of the IPEMA specifications and safety codes that they would have. Um, and so that's pretty natural. And so what we found is that synthetic turf can really come in and, and make a difference uh, there in the community, enhance it. Uh, safety, compliance, and documentation is very important. Going back to that very first image where you have the, the fire ratings, uh, that's a great example of it. There's actually two fire ratings uh, that we use. One is a basic uh, pill test that measures if you drop a, let's just say a cigarette, um, you know, what's going to happen? Is it going to you know, immediately combust? The second question, the E108, really addresses flame spread. So once this thing is caught on fire, then what's going to happen? How much is it going to spread, right? So all those kinds of things are very important. We spend a lot of money, a lot of time. We have a product manager who uh, works his little heart out, making sure that all those are, are up to date um, and even finds more uh, new ones. Um, lead credits and USDA systems. Uh, we are always looking for ways that we can enhance what we do. We understand 
uh, that, that we're creating a plastic material. And so we take that responsibility very seriously, uh, whether it's testing to make sure that uh, PFAs aren't included um, or, uh, or even odd, uh, odd chemical mixes, formaldehyde, things of that nature. Uh, we wanna make sure that we deliver uh, the best product uh, out there in the, in the field. And then finally, I would say in terms of sustainability, being able to uh, reliably replicate a construction. Uh, throughout the United States is very important. So if you think about the longevity of a product uh, and project, the longer you have it in, the better your ROI is. So typically we would say that an ROI is found within two to four years. A lot of that's predicated on the actual use of it. Um, but the longer it's in, the better off uh, you're, you are in terms of your, your ROI. Okay, so uh, trends. Here's what, here's what we're discovering. Um, and, and we'll address it this way. Um, artificial living wall. Um, so these are sustainable solutions. They kind of soften hard spaces. Uh, they create uh, kind of a, a vertical cushion, uh, if you will, uh, that's aesthetically pleasing. So we'll address some of that. We'll address synthetic turf and poor in place design. So these are typically found in courtyards. They might be clinics, um, uh, spine clinics, uh, things of that nature. We'll talk about rooftops, children's hospitals, and also playgrounds. And then finally, and um, this is where it's kind of fun for me, we'll talk about some societal interests as well, um, including wellness uh, and wellness interests, including homelessness, uh, seniors and aging in place. Uh, so we're, you know, kind of encountering the silver tsunami now uh, with the baby boomers, um, you know, retiring and whatnot, and then also pets um, as uh, an alternative therapy. So we'll address some of these in the next uh, few moments here. So um, uh, the artificial living walls, uh, oftentimes we see these in courtyard environments. Uh, this is a Miami Cancer uh, Center, uh, obviously down in Miami. Uh, so this is a uh, courtyard created for patients on the one side, you have a dividing green screen and on the other, it's kind of a respite uh, lunch area for a lot of the, um, the staff members and doctors. Uh, they did have uh, that green screen in the middle loaded up with natural plant material and uh, it just does not last. Uh, we like the idea of it lasting. Uh, we, we find that it, it just doesn't last as well as what people think it will. And so you enter the, uh, the artificial living wall systems and you find that you have that lush look uh, it's, a, it's a breathable material, so you get that proper airflow, and it looks phenomenal um, and withstands the elements, um, regardless of whether you're in a, a full sun environment or up north with snow. Uh, green wall design uh, can just enhance the outside of the building. Uh, I know the fisheye lens is a little, little interesting here, but it's a, it's a pretty cool shot of a cancer center. Um, and you'll see that they've incorporated the artwork and the, and the artificial living wall as well. So I think this is just a real uh, creative adaptive uh, uh, use of this adaptive space. Uh, the Norton Healthcare System, we've done at least a couple projects with them. Uh, this uses both the artificial living wall, uh, living plant material, and then synthetic turf. This is kind of a healing courtyard. Uh, was the concept. So you'll see that uh, like a lot of hospitals, you've got, uh, you got a lot of cement around it. So it's right next to the parking garage here. Um, but there's a, a wraparound wall, you'll see a little bit of a, a mirrored frame here, uh, like a window frame. And so the idea was that it's just a place to get away and, um, and relax and uh, just have a few moments to kind of catch up with yourself, if you will. Uh, the turf area down below is actually slightly mounted so it, it's raised up by about six inches uh, just to provide a little bit of um, interest that way. Um, clinics, we're seeing a ton of work uh, happen with clinics these days. Uh, this particular one is in South Dakota. Uh, it's an orthopedic and uh, spine center. Um, it is a prefabricated project. So all of this here is, um, is kind of assembled, uh, cut by a water jet and assembled uh, here in North Georgia, and then shipped across the United States. Um, and I, I had to learn a little bit about this because I'm obviously not a doctor, uh, but the asterisks, the stars, the dots, the ladder, uh, those are all standardized drills as part of the spine care um, and recovery. And so they're, uh, they're measured and monitored and, uh, and the doctors over time can take an athlete from 
uh, not being able to, to move or not having a whole lot of mobility to full mobility. And so again, everything about this project is standardized uh, nationally, but then built directly into the turf itself. So you're, you're not tripping over equipment and um, the, uh, the assistants are not having to, to lay out this equipment every time you've got a patient coming in. Uh, Hamilton Healthcare System. Uh, this was an interesting one. Uh, Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson actually come to this particular uh, location. This is uh, based in North Georgia, uh, Dr. Love's Clinic. Um, because he's very golf centric, he's looking at back injuries, power strokes, things of that nature. And so it was very important that he simulated a, um, a golf surface. So golf surfaces, you imagine, um, allow you to not just uh, kind of capture the power strokes as you will, um, but you also have those fine motor movements as well. So off the screen here, he's got a, uh, a full swing golf and a foresight monitor. And then they also are able to do some speed and weight drills as well um, on some other synthetic turf. So again, uh, the turf is selected for very specific healthcare um, applications. Uh, this rehabilitation center is part of the Atlantic healthcare system. Um, in New Jersey, this was interesting to me as they were wanting to simulate a number of uh, softscape and hardscape surfaces, uh, as well as uh, the fine motor movements. And so you'll see here, you've got some inclines, you've got some flat surfaces, you've got your ramps uh, for wheelchairs, you've got a little bit of the netting there for, uh, for the golf swing. So they've really incorporated um, a number of the different products that we have. Um, into very specific therapies and rehabilitation um, that, they're, that they're after. Um, moving from <clears throat> some of these uh, clinics to uh, rooftop projects, we, we see a lot of these. Uh, this one happens to incorporate uh, senior living. Uh, this is also based in Houston. Um, it's actually uh, three different projects. So you'll see the one in the, in the middle here is um, for assisted, um, it's actually independent living. Um, and this uses a product called Sinrai 200, it's our rooftop platinum, it's a um, E108 uh, product, uh, so it gives you your fire rating so you can uh, pass fire code and things of that nature, a little important, um, but this is really for people who um, have a lot of mobility, they've just moved into this kind of a community. On the left-hand side, uh, that product is really used just to, uh, just for aesthetics, just to cover up um, you know, just kind of an ugly rooftop space. And we see more and more of this occur. In fact, I was just uh, reviewing a project in Toronto yesterday uh, where they're looking to cover a, a gigantic space with synthetic turf uh, just for this reason. This particular facility, as you go up a few floors, you're gonna find uh, the assisted living and dementia care. Um, those needs and conditions change quite a bit. So they actually use a LTD or low tight dense turf that's also fire rated. Um, and, and it's perfect uh, for um, wheelchairs and for shuffling across it and also canes. Um, and so again, you'll find that the products are used in very specific ways um, you know, in, these, in these facilities. Uh, another example of a rooftop project, this is the Rainbow Babies Project in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, this is uh, used for children primarily and families. Um, they do, uh, you know, again, respite, uh, some of the transfusions and things of that nature can occur up here. And this particular project uh, just used a little bit of turf. Um, it was constructed over uh, geofoam. Uh, so you'll see it's got a, a little bit of a mound uh, there. And one of the uh, reasons I use uh, this photo is, is just to point out that our synthetic turf is ADA compliant. Uh, it meets work for, uh, workforce um, requirements. Um, but the way that you actually put the synthetic turf down is also very important, right? So um, having it next to a planter or other uh, railings and things of that nature um, have to be taken into account when you look at ADA compliance. Uh, we also look at ADA compliance in terms of access, um, wheelchair access and being able to move, uh, provide that access from point A to point B. And a lot of the times it's moving a barbecue pit around or providing a different um, style of synthetic turf to create that walkway from point A to point B. Um, again, kind of in the, uh, the realm of rooftops, um, this is the Dayton Children's Hospital. Um, I had mentioned the port in place. So again, this is a very cushiony surface. Um, it's, a, it's a great use of this space. 
Um, and it, you can also get very creative with it, uh, obviously with this airplane shape. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Dayton, it's kind of the birthplace of aviation uh, with the Wright brothers being from there. So the airplane motif, again, design related and really fits the community. Another trend that we're seeing uh, in, in healthcare is, is with playgrounds, believe it or not. Uh, we do a ton of work in recreation with uh, park and recreation and also with schools, but these are a little bit different. Um, these are special needs uh, children. Um, you have a lot of um, uh, issues uh, with them and they might not be able to um, play with uh, the same way with kids. It can be autism, it can be just uh, different learning styles. Uh, that they want to incorporate. Uh, so this is a project in uh, the Midwest uh, that, that one of our, you know, absolutely phenomenal uh, distributors put in, uh, Angela Grego, uh, and it's just a great example of being able to incorporate synthetic turf in a real creative way uh, that's very meaningful uh, to children as well. Uh, synthetic turf, when you uh, use it for playgrounds, it uh, does use a safety underlayment uh, so there's some different things that we do to ensure that it has uh, IPEMA uh, compliance. Uh, as you imagine, um, you know, the, the height of the structures that you're on play a very large role in this. This is kind of part and parcel of what we do in Sinlon because we do so many other playgrounds. I just want to point it out, uh, point out that, you know, on this kind of an application, you're going to have a, uh, a variety of different foam pads that you can use. And that's going to be different than an, a rooftop application or even just a landscape application. Uh, we're also seeing playgrounds being used for hospital uh, staff. Um, this is uh, not just an amenity or, or a, um, a benefit that the hospital can provide for their staffing members, but it, it really enhances the community as well uh, without placing a burden on, on, uh, on other facilities. So you can see here the construction of it. Uh, you can see the, the bender board around the tree well. Uh, so we typically don't take synthetic turf all the way up to the trunk of the tree. Uh, we, do, we do like them to breathe. Uh, and again, the synthetic turf is perforated. So water uh, certainly percolates and gets down below, but it's just an example of the construction process I wanna make sure I shared with you. Now, moving to some of the other uh, softer issues that I was mentioning, uh, but also controversial at the same time. This is another um, uh, Norton project. It's a grand entrance that was put in about five years ago um, for a women and children's uh, hospital. Um, they had a uh, kind of an interesting issue, and uh, there was a, a large homeless population that was that was here. Um, and as difficult as these concepts uh, may be, for those of you with families, uh, you can understand that at that time, you know, you you uh, you might not necessarily want them there at that front entrance, right? And so, one of the ways that you work through uh, homeless uh, homelessness wherever you're located, uh, whether in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, you know, on my way to the airport, whether you're in San Diego, whatever the story would be, um, they would often use uh, lighting. Uh, they use kind of clean surfacing and they often use mounding like this where it's difficult to to pitch a tent uh, or lay on so it kind of discourages homeless homelessness and moves it elsewhere um, i've also seen this in new york city with washington square park uh, where uh, you know when i visited it last you know the the synthetic portion of it was very alive and active and you had kids playing there and families um, and then underneath the trees that did not have synthetic turf, it was a slightly different story. So, um, you know, so the park and rec districts are really recognizing the value of synthetic turf as well and how you can uh, move some of the population around. So again, kind of controversial, but, but important when we're talking about safety and healthcare. Um, we're also seeing veteran and uh, senior parks as well. So it's great for the kids. And as you're moving on in, in life, uh, you still deserve your own park. Uh, so as we're, for those of us who are over 50, uh, now we can crank out our Fitbit or use our Apple Watch. Uh, some of them can be tied into uh, this actual equipment here. So you can measure um, how this plays out, your repetition, um, how many times you come to the park, uh, what your heart rates are. And so we're seeing these in either public parks like this one um, or also in senior living communities as well. And again, we'll kind of touch on that in a few moments here. Um, Multifamily projects, uh, just like at the beginning, you know these these uh, you know that beginning shot. They tend to be um, high end uh, condos or apartment um, apartment communities, essentially. 
Uh, one of the different uh, unique offshoots of this is the 55 plus community. So uh, for myself, who's kind of nearing that age, uh, you don't necessarily want to uh, always be around a bunch of 18 year olds going to school, right? That gets a little interesting. Uh, so you kind of focus or bond around your own uh, age set, if you will. Um, and what we're finding here is amenities like golf are very important. Now, I'd mentioned golf before, and you're going to see on this particular photo uh, that golf projects are used very differently. So you're going to have more holes. Um, it's going to oftentimes incorporate hardscapes or seating uh, because they're used for uh, socialization a lot. Uh, fine motor skills. Um, and then you're also going to find that it doesn't have bunkers. It tends to be kind of a, a flatter uh, type of a project. So that's one of the ways that we would design for 55 plus um, healthcare um, amenities. Secure courtyards. Uh, so this is also kind of interesting. So when you think about your senior living, um, you know, centers, they're often built in a, in a courtyard. Uh, for obvious reasons. Um, you know, if we think about our parents, we don't want them to wander sometimes. We want to make sure that they're well taken care of. Um, if you're in the dementia care and assisted side of things, um, uh, mowers can get very disorienting, uh, having mowing crews come through. And so having a very uh, simple, stable environment is very important. So this is a, a fantastic project that was done in Ohio. Um, by our distributor up there. And you'll see you have a just a wonderful transition, a beautiful spot uh, and very reliable as well. And again, uh, just like that other photo I showed you um, of that big lagoon, you can be on this surface, um, you know, much quicker and for a longer period of time throughout the year, uh, which in locations like Ohio become very important. So if you can get an extra month on it uh, before and after a uh, typical season, uh, that becomes very important. Um, again, another project um, in Ohio, this is part of a independent living community. So again, health, kind of healthcare related or wellness related. Uh, this is a series of homes. Uh, they typically are clustered around assisted living um, in hospital centers. Um, these independent uh, living cottages incorporate synthetic turf uh, directly into the backyard packages. Uh, you don't have to worry about mowing, mowers, uh, dragging weed eaters through or anything of that nature and independent living, of course, very different from dementia care. Uh, uh, this uh, demographic tends to be highly mobile. mobile. So they're still traveling, they're having people over, uh, they're highly uh, entertaining and entertained. Um, and so all of those kinds of um, aspects of living are very important. Synthetic turf plays a strong role there. Uh, pets and healing. So this is a, a new one that I'm learning about. Um, uh, animals are often incorporated into the healing process. This is a, um, a hospital project done in uh, Denver or near Denver in Aurora. Uh, this is actually the pet relief area. So you'll see that they uh, built a number of mounds. Uh, this is done with aggregate. Uh, you'll see a lot of mounds uh, in, our, in our work. So that's also a trend. Um, and the medical dogs um, are very important for uh, uh, children, whether they're um, you know, in, in a, a deeply acute care or whether they're there just to uh, kind of bounce back into shape. Um, having the dogs present are very important. So this is just an area that allows them to, uh, the dogs to get a little relief from the kids as it were. Uh, interestingly enough too, we use a very specific um, pet material for this. It's a uh, double hole punch. So um, urine and waste matter can flow through even faster. Uh, we used um, a product called Envirofill for the infill, uh, which really captures the ammonia. Um, in dog urine and uh, neutralizes it. And also because healthcare is very important to hospitals, um, uh, the products were submitted uh, to the hospital chemists uh, for review as well. So again, we can do that on our side. Uh, we use third-party testing, um, but you know, oftentimes we can get into those kind of scenarios too. And so that's uh, part and parcel of what we do. Uh, mental health, uh, again, kind of a sobering, uh, somewhat, um, you know, controversial uh, piece, I suppose. Um, if you look at the surrounding, you realize uh, there's not a whole lot of options besides synthetic turf. You could put more cement down. 
Um, you can't really put stone or rock down. And so the synthetic turf really offers a creative and really cool option in this, um, in this hospital setting in Michigan. You'll see that they, offer, uh, that they also use those texturized squares uh, there at the bottom. And that's, uh, again, has a lot to do with the therapies and just kind of breaks up the project uh, visually as well. So um, we do tend to be at the top of the, the heap in terms of what we do. Um, uh, but one of the challenges that we have is commoditization. And we understand uh, whether it's a car or whether it's a surgery um, that, you know, going for the budget surgery or the cheapest car isn't necessarily what you want. So we do see commoditization occur. Uh, it tends to show up in either poor turf quality or an inappropriate solution, uh, selection rather, or a shortcut to construction. So I'll just spend just a few moments on this. Uh, you'll see the, uh, the image at the top there. Uh, someone felt that they could just kind of scab a bunch of uh, pieces together. Um, obviously, you'll, you'll see that the seam work is very important because it's apparent. It's just kind of a patchwork here. And if you look closely enough, you'll see that it's got lumps and bumps there because the base work was not prepared correctly. Uh, so it's just a, a great example of an inappropriate uh, selection um, and quality, uh, quality of work. Um, so they, they obviously save some money in the construction and, and product, but uh, not in the end result. Uh, the picture, picture in the middle, uh, this is for a hotel project that was done in San Diego some years ago. Uh, they used a polyethylene product, not a nylon product, and polyethylene has a lower melt point. Um, unfortunately, this uh, inappropriate turf selection right next to a, a, a parking lot meant that the car exhaust melted the entire 150 foot stretch um, and it looks just like cigarette burns in a, in a, uh, in a car seat. Um, of course, this is put in by uh, two guys in a truck, so they were nowhere to be found. Um, and unfortunately, the hotel that it really set out to create a really cool, sustainable uh, project and property in mind um, ended up with a bit of a nightmare here. And finally, the product on the lower right-hand side, um, this is a great example. This is also from uh, San Diego. Uh, this just shows uh, what happens if you have not secured the perimeter and if you don't use um, an appropriate amount of infill. So this is the dimensional stability that I was telling you about. And so if you think about a tablecloth on top of a table, um, it tends to wrinkle, right? So you really want to tighten that down and make sure that it doesn't move anywhere. Um, and this is just a great visual example um, of that. Um, so where can you find our stuff? Uh, first of all, you can always go to the Sinlon website. You can, um, you can find us in the contact us page. You can uh, type in your zip code and that'll uh, drive you directly to your local distributor. Uh, we do work very closely with them. So of course you can always reach out uh, to me or us at the corporate office as well. Uh, if you're a little shy in speaking with people or you don't wanna spend all the time in the world going to a website, uh, you can certainly visit CAD details or BSD spec link or master spec and grab either drawings or specification information uh, directly from, uh, from there. So uh, that's what I've got uh, for us. And I'm going to turn this back to, uh, to Jenna Beth. I know that I tend to talk very quickly. So uh, thank you very much for that opportunity. And um, Jenna Beth, uh, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Rob. I'm, uh, I'm really excited about this idea of senior playgrounds. Playgrounds for older folks, that would be fun. <laughs> um, so uh, just a couple of housekeeping things in that. We have some questions coming in and, we'll, and I will get to them and read them to Rob. Um, just a reminder for AIA credits. Um, I've got some folks that have messaged me on the chat or questions, I've got those. Some other folks' emails are coming in. Um, also, we will do certificates of completion if you wanna self-report to other organizations. So just email me, um, my email address is in the chat by Friday and we'll get them all compiled and then take care of them beginning of next week. And if you have any other questions, we'll also post the recording of today's webinar on our website as well, if you wanna pass it along to folks. So um, now we will get into this question, um, some questions. And so Rob, we've got one here that says, um, what is a typical assembly when using the geoform to create mounds? And it says, goes on to say, where is a geofoam located relative to the standard assembly components you outlined? Okay, uh, so that's a lot of that's a lot of words, and I'm not an installer, but I'll take a little bit of a stab at it. Um, so typically, we would use geofoam for uh, smaller heights on a mound. Uh, so it really does depend on the application, and I would recommend 
reaching out to that that local installer. So uh, there was an image of a of a rooftop, uh, the Rainbow Babies image, uh, that had. Um, let me see if I can scroll to it here really quick. Um, and it had just a little bit of an incline. Um, it was not uh, typically rolled down quite a bit. So it was kind of a, a non-functional uh, assembly, if you will. And so um, in those cases, the geofoam is just kind of stacked up. Um, in cases like that hospital in, uh, in Denver with the, um, uh, with the dogs on them, uh, that's aggregate and then uh, that's compacted. And then in other situations, you actually have a cement uh, mound, which is a little bit more expensive, but that tends to be uh, one of the strongest. It's not gonna shift or settle on you. Um, so depending upon the uh, dimensions of the mound and the height, uh, you, would, uh, you would typically kind of stack it, uh, put it together, you can glue them, and then you would put the turf on top of that. Great. All right. So looking here, we have another question. Um, oh, uh, and I'm sorry. Let me let me add to uh, we um, when you put the turf on top, we like to start it at the top and kind of drape it down. And then you uh, you end up with a series of relief cuts around the outside. So if you think about a mound, um, uh, a perfectly uh, circular mound, uh, you know, that's kind of one aspect of it. A lot of times out in the field, we're building uh, conjoining mounds. Uh, six foot high mounds, even nine uh, nine foot high mounds I've seen uh, that people slide down for weddings or, or have slides attached to them. So um, your application counts for a lot. Great. All right. Um, let's see. The next question is, how long does synthetic turf last? Great question. So we always recommend um, going through a certified installer. Um, we do have a limited lifetime warranty. Uh, we did construct that uh, certainly around commercial projects in mind because we understand you're going to have a lot more traffic. So um, synthetic turf will easily last 15 to 20 years. Uh, I don't typically see it, seen it uh, pull up because it, it, it goes bad, right? Um, it's designed to last for a very, very long time. Uh, what I do see is people will, um, you know, install a new building or they're put in a pool or something of that nature. But typically, once that project is in the ground, um, that's going to stay there for you know, a good 15, 20 years easily. Um, so the next question is, how is the transition between turf and tile addressed? Is it smooth? Um, there's a couple of different ways that we can address it. Um, but by and large, if you imagine your hardscaping, whether it's a porcelain tile on a roof or a, um, or a paver, we designed the turf so um, the bottom of the turf sits just a little bit below uh, that hardscaping. And then remember the infill that I talked about. Well, that infill, once it fills up the turf, that uh, creates a smooth transition from the hardscape to that um, uh, to that landscaped area, to that, that turfed area. The turf is designed to be stepped on, so it's not going to hurt it. And it goes back to that, uh, that spring back concept that I was telling you about. So as you move your foot from the porcelain tile or the hardscape uh, onto the turf, the turf's going to uh, um, go down and then pop right back up. But that, that infill is going to provide a, um, a smooth transition. So I hope I've explain that the right way. Uh, rooftop construction, um, very similar concept, uh, but it can be a lot more complex because you're really filling a void, right? And you might have different um, uh, systems that you have to use because typically on a rooftop, you know, you're, we're, not, we're not taking our turf and screwing it into a rooftop, otherwise you get leaks. And so it can be uh, very complex and have to be addressed differently. All right, great. We've got two more questions here. The first one is, Will Sinlon take back the turf at the end of the life cycle? Okay, uh, great question. Uh, the answer is no. Um, it's, um, it is a recyclable material, uh, but like a lot of recycling programs, um, it can be a little bit of a bear to do. So um, to recycle turf, you would have to remove the infill component, and then you'd have to get it from point A to point B. So we don't, we don't have trucks that you know run out to uh, Boise, Idaho to remove 300 square feet uh, to bring it to a uh, recycling center. So if you can imagine that kind of a process, it can be quite complex. That said, um, we do have a, um, a very strong uh, recycling program in place. So the, the perimeter board that I talked about um, earlier, 
um, we actually use synthetic turf scraps in that perimeter board. So we are practicing cradle to cradle recycling there. Um, and we do, uh, we have created a, um, a recycling center in the United States that should be going live towards the end of this year where you can take product and recycle that into benches and other site furnishings. So uh, we do take it seriously. I'm just kind of taking a few moments to explain um, a little of the complexity um, of it. We uh, our guys out in the field too. If if there are turf scraps, so obviously you know you might have a little bit left over. Uh, they do a lot to have um, Facebook sales or to cut them up into um, you know mats or little uh, door pieces that people can purchase from time to time for their pets and things of that nature. So we use up as much as we can. Okay, great. So the last question, Rob, is um, what is the temperature of turf on a hot day relative to air temperature, and what is the rating for heat? reflectivity, IG to meet lead? <laughs> okay, great question. So on the last one, I'm going to, I'm going to claim ignorance on that. Uh, but if you're looking for the solar reflective index, uh, we can send that documentation uh, to you. Uh, I just don't have a number in front of me, but I can, I can certainly send that out to you. Um, so here's the deal with turf. Turf does get hot. Uh, for those of us that are in climates where we um, maybe have kids that play on uh, soccer fields and things of that nature, uh, we know that it, it does get warm. Um, anything over 120 degrees, which sounds like a lot, but 120 degrees is where you start to lift up your feet, you know, uh, move your hand off of a slide, you know, you say the concrete's warm, the water fountain's warm, things of that nature. Um, so synthetic turf is, um, uh, is, it is a plastic, it does not retain heat. So under a overcast day, it's not gonna, uh, it might feel warm, uh, but it's not gonna be super hot. If you live in Florida, or, or I should say, if you live in Texas and it's a, it's a very hot day, um, it can be really um, uh, coming down on you. Um, the turf can heat up quite a bit, 150 degrees, um, you know, isn't entirely uncommon. And so you'll see in like playground areas, you might have a shade structure for it. Um, and now, of course, if you're overcast or if it's, you know, between two buildings and shaded, you're not going to feel those same temperatures. Now, at the very beginning, I had mentioned some of the specialty infills that, that we have, and that's also very important because it works in concert with our um, with our heat block technology uh, it, that's that's in our turf that, that doesn't absorb the heat. Um, but the uh, the infill actually absorbs moisture and then slowly releases it, cooling it down. So very much like your body um, sweating. Um, you know, so it's kind of a natural process that cools it down by a good 30 degrees or so, and it's antimicrobial. So we do recognize the heat uh, challenges out there. We address that through the master batch and, and the products that we actually make, and then also the infills that we use as well. So it's that entire turf system. I hope I answered that uh, in a, <laughs> try to answer that as simply as possible. Uh, you're on mute there, Genevieve. Sorry, I was muted for a second. I forgot. Um, the other thing is I will also get, Rob, all of the folks that asked the questions. So if there's any follow-up and you obviously have his information as well and you can um, get some more information. So thank you again, Rob, for this afternoon's presentation. Um, thank okay. you to Sinlon for sponsoring, for bringing today's content. It was certainly very worthwhile. I love the questions coming in from everybody. Thank you. Um, and we're just glad that you were all able to join us. We'll be doing some more webinars. Um, in 2022, just keep an eye out for your email. And of course, we will be looking forward to our in-person event this fall um, in September in Long Beach, California. And um, thank you all very much for joining us. Thanks again, Rob. Everybody have a great afternoon. Take care. Thank you.